We turn now to San Francisco um, and the idea of Haight-Ashbury being the heart and center of the psychedelic movement in the late 1960s. One topic that we can engage that I've, I've mentioned before is this idea of subcultures and how they work in popular music. A lot of scholars are really interested in subcultures because it's interesting to be able to get into a culture that's small enough that you can really tell how music is used as ways of forming identity and uh, uh, various kinds of issues, how people use the music to affirm values and this kind of thing. And so subcultures are something that a lot of scholars talk a lot about. So when we talk about psychedelia uh, with regard to Haight-Ashbury, we really are for the first while, the first couple years of it anyway, talking about a subculture because um, in many ways you didn't really know about what was going on in, in Haight-Ashbury. Maybe early 1967 with the human being, which we'll talk about in just a minute, but certainly by the summer of 67, the summer of love, uh, Scott McKenzie, you come to San Francisco with flowers in your hair, this kind of thing. That's when San Francisco really starts to hit the mainstream. But we can trace the history of psychedelia in San Francisco all the way back to 1965, uh, easily two years before it hit the mainstream. So for those two years, it was kind of a subculture uh, scene. So as I said before, uh, uh, psychedelia uh, in San Francisco developed around the Haight-Ashbury district. It's just a district, a fantastic sort of little neighborhood of 19th century homes with a, 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 a street down the center of it, the Haight, uh, with shops and Ashbury is one of the cross streets there. Uh, goes right up against Golden Gate Park. As you get to the end of the Haight-Ashbury District, you can cross the street and you're in Golden Gate Park, which is, if you've never been there, it's a fantastic park in San Francisco. I don't know how people who live in San Francisco can ever get out of that park. Uh, it's a fantastic place to hang around. The first stirrings of psychedelia, that is the use of LSD trips and you know parties where people got together with LSD and listened to music, uh, can actually be seen out in Virginia City, Nevada in the summer of 1965. Five. So just a couple months after the Beatles had first had their first uh, dental experience, as George Harrison called it, uh, we see a lot of students going out to a place called the Red Dog Saloon in Virginia City, not a very long uh, car ride to get out there, and dropping acid while they listen to music of uh, artists like the Charlatans, right? These are the first real sort of acid parties that become the kind of prototype for what's going to make its way uh, back to San Francisco. By the fall of 1965, so that summer ends, we get into the fall of 1965, you start to see the first psychedelic events occurring. A group that helped organize a lot of them was a group called the Family Dog. That's what they called themselves. And they, they would organize these evenings that would have a couple of bands on. There would be a light show. I mean, everything we've come to associate with a kind of San Francisco psychedelic event. They would get, you know, longshoremen's halls or places like that, whatever they could rent out relatively cheap and inexpensive, uh, inexpensively, and then call the evening. A couple of the evenings that the family dog put on were a tribute to Doctor Strange, and one, I like this one a lot. A tribute to Sparkle Plenty. You start to see the posters for these. It starts to have all that kind of psychedelic uh, San Francisco poster art that we're used to. And remembering that we're talking about the fall of 1965. So no, but if you're not there, you don't even know this is happening. This is not happening nationally, internationally. It's only happening in this neighborhood. Hate Ashbury. You got to be there to know that it's happening. Um, now, the the important person on this scene. Uh, is a guy by the name of Ken Kesey, an author. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, one of his classic uh, novels. And the idea of the uh, acid test, uh, written about by Tom Wolfe as the Kool-Aid acid test, right? And the acid tests were basically uh, Ken Kesey and his bunch of followers, the Merry Pranksters or his buddies or, or whatever, you, whatever they may have been, uh, going around and from town to town on a bus, a psychedelically painted bus that where the destination would be on most buses like Detroit, Chicago, you know, Boston. Instead, it says further, right? Because they're going to take people further. They're going to go to a town, they hand out flyers, they tell them there's going to be an acid test out past the city limits where the, they can't get in trouble with the law. And for a dollar, you come in, you buy your tab of acid, and you hang out all night, and you trip. They were sort of the Johnny Appleseeds of acid in the, in the sort of drivable area around San Francisco. Now, as I said before, there are two ways maybe that you want to think about LSD. One is the more idealistic way. A guy like Timothy Leary, for example, a, psych, a, guy, a guy trained in psychology, psychiatry, uh, wrote, actually wrote a book uh, called uh, 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 The Psychedelic Experience. Um, 
influenced in part maybe by the Aldous Huxley book, uh, uh, The Doors of Perception. But uh, uh, Timothy Leary writes a kind of a clinical book uh, 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 about the psychedelic experience. And what he's saying uh, to kids is, you know, they need to uh, turn on, uh, tune in, and drop out. But what he's really trying to do is to raise their consciousness. So he says, Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters, they're just looking for a good time. They're, they're a little bit sort of like Dadaist, um, you know, anti-conformist kind of crazoids. And that's sort of what that's about. Well, um, people start to get in the Haight-Ashbury, start to get real turned on to uh, LSD and this counterculture uh, uh, experience that they're trying to develop. Mostly young people we're talking about, but college age. We're not talking about teenagers here. We're talking about uh, kids who are old enough to be in college or older than that, uh, living in homes uh, there in the, in the area. And in January of 1967, they put together something called the Human Be-In, right? Sort of playing on the idea of human being, human be-in. Well, this idea of be-in, uh, you start to get all kinds, once it starts to hit the culture, people start to do all kinds of ins. There's sit-ins, love-ins, Rowan and Martin's laugh-in. Everything becomes a kind of an in. But the first one was this human being, so-called gathering of the tribes, where they got music together and beat poets like uh, Allen Ginsberg, the guy who developed a lot of this asset, a fellow named Owsley uh, Stanley, Timothy Leary was there, and they got all these guys together in Golden Gate Park and had this big free festival that was sort of the beginning of the whole countercultural thing. It actually got national press co coverage, and people couldn't believe the crazy people showing up doing crazy things in San Francisco, and of course they attribute it to those doggone drugs that were making them lose their mind. Anyway, that's the first moment that we see the, the subculture starting to sort of uh, make an appearance on the national uh, radar. What starts to happen in San Francisco is Bill Graham opens up a place called the Fillmore, which becomes a key venue for these psychedelic events and concerts. And Chet Helms opens up the Avalon Ballroom. So now there are two, two uh, concert halls that are pretty much devoted and outfitted for sound and for lights to create these kinds of psychedelic evenings. And so now it started to become more organized. Actually, the Fillmore and the Avalon start to become the kind of model for what will become venues all across the country in a couple years that will become the places that groups play. At this time, if you're the Beatles or something going around, you're playing stadiums, you're playing places that were never really designed for rock concerts. But now, with the Fillmore and with the Avalon, you get places that were designed, that are primarily designed to be places where rock concerts uh, will, will uh, take place. Also in San Francisco at this time, a fellow by the name of Tom Donahue, who'd been involved with the development of AM radio, gets the idea that it would be nice to have a radio station that just played the music the DJ wanted to play, which is something you could not do on Top 40 radio. And so, as the story goes, he wanted to get a, a station he could get cheap. FM radio was largely unused at that time. It was mostly used by religious groups for evangelical purposes or by universities for correspondence courses, and maybe play classical music. Uh, so FM then was really, a lot of people didn't even have FM on their radio. If you got a car, you only had an AM radio. Um, and so Tom Donahue, as the story goes, called around FM stations in the area until he found one that had had its phone disconnected figuring that things must really be bad at an FM station if you can't even pay the phone bill. I'll go talk to them. I'll bet they won't have any problem with me going on the air. So he goes on the air and starts to play all kinds of things he couldn't play on AM uh, out of his own album collection. And it turns out people in the Haight-Ashbury were tuning in and listening. And this whole idea of developing FM radio based around a kind of a free form uh, uh, format, uh, based around album oriented kinds of tracks. I mean, you, uh, a DJ could say, you know, I want to talk about, uh, we're, we're going to do a set of tunes that have to do with flying. And then like try to drag out of his record collection different tunes that he thought had to do with flying or something like that. And it could be any topic, or there didn't have to be a topic at all. Who knows? Great guitar solos. Whatever it took. You could do whatever you wanted. And it was kind of trippy, right? And it, uh, it, people in Haight-Ashbury started to tune in. Well, the FM radio format really started to catch on with them. And like anything that catches on, somebody comes in and figures out, well, there's got to be a way to make money. And before you know it, we get into the 70s, there's FM radio all across the country. But it really starts right here in San Francisco 
There are other FM freeform uh, uh, stations that, that, uh, that arise at about the same time, so we shouldn't say it was only happening in San Francisco, but it certainly is important that it was happening there at this time uh, via Tom Donahue. Also, we get for the first time uh, uh, magazines that are specifically devoted to rock culture. There have always been teen magazines, Teen Beat, that put pictures of, you know, uh, Paul McCartney and Peter Noon and people like that on the cover. But now we're talking about newspapers like The Oracle first, and then Rolling Stone, which came out of San Francisco during these years, which were really devoted to the music itself and the culture uh, around it. The first head shops uh, opened in San Francisco, the most uh, important of those being the psychedelic shop, where you could go and get music and beaded curtains and incense and incense burners and uh, drug paraphernalia, rolling papers, bongs, water pipes, whatever you might need. And it was all there, really catering specifically to this kind of hippie culture kind of thing. It didn't take too much longer. We get into the late, the very late 60s, the early 1970s, when you could find head shops all around the country where this kind of thing went on. And they became kind of HQ in that town, headquarters in that town, uh, for what was going on in the counterculture in that town. But it, a lot of it starts uh, right there in San Francisco. Well, that gives you an idea of what was happening in the San Francisco subculture. In the next video, we'll talk about some of the groups who were important in this San Francisco culture.